Good morning. Uh, I speak on this topic quite a bit, so uh, a lot of the material in this talk is going to be very basic background material that I'm probably going to skim over pretty quickly because I suspect a lot of you are a lot more savvy than that. If I'm skipping something you want to talk about, though, listen, let's approach this really informally. Feel free to raise that hand and ask some questions. And so, off we go. Thank you. So, our flower balloons. Uh, a quick outline. We're going to talk about what the stuff is, what causes the balloons, some concerns re regarding our model balloons, and then some management strategies. Uh, so first, when we say harm model, we're almost always talking about something that's not algae at all. It's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine that the popular press has kind of vilified algae because algae is extremely important to the base of the food web. What we're talking about is actually cyanobacteria, which are commonly called blue-green algae, and they're technically not algae at all. Um, they're recognized as bacteria. They contain chlorophyll, so they are green, which allows them to do photosynthesis, so they take in sunlight, which manufactures sugars for their own energy, and byproduct, of course, of photosynthesis is oxygen as well. Um, most of these things grow together as colonies. Uh, most of them are capable of fixing their own nitrogen from the atmosphere using these specialized cells called heterocytes. So they, um, they're much less limited by the availability of nitrogen because most of them can draw nitrogen from the atmosphere. Um, and when we say bloom, we're talking about simply an excessive growth of algae or plankton of some kind. Uh, the appearance varies a lot. Um, that big shot in the middle actually is a Planktothrix bloom on Grand Lake. Um, so often it'll appear as kind of this dark green stain in the water. Uh, the microcystis often materializes as these kind of bright opaque green surface scums. Uh, a big, uh, some of the filamentous stuff can appear black when it appears in shallow water and falls to the surface, some of the hairy type stuff. So a broad, a whole lot of this. Usually some green associated, often some darker colors. The really bad blooms can often have like a turquoise or a white foaminess associated with it. Um, the big players, especially on Grand Lake, microcystis is the big one. Uh, its colonies form these little green blobs. They can turn that water column green, or if they're floating on the surface, they will form these really bright, opaque slits on the surface. Um, these often have these patches of turquoise or white foaminess if in a really bad bloom and the stuff's really does. Microcystis is interesting in that it cannot fix nitrogen. It needs to draw nitrogen from the water as a nutrient, but it's really good at scavenging nitrogen. It really outcompetes a lot of other organisms for nitrogen. And far and away, this is the most common of these organisms to bloom in Ohio and included on Grand Lake. Uh, Planktothrix I have up next because it is also very common to Grand Lake. Um, these form these kind of hair-like filaments that are planktonic, so they drift in the open water. They don't really coalesce into globs. They just kind of turn the water generally green. Um, often can be associated in a really dense bloom with kind of an oily surface scum. Uh, this can also not fix nitrogen and very common in recent years. Um, some guys at the EPA even suspect that planktothrix is the most common to reservoirs from Ohio. Um, Oscillatoria, often material, it, it functions a lot like planktothrix. Um, it looks a lot like planktothrix, but oscillatoria grows on the bottom as kind of this blue scum. Uh, you'll often see it in shallow water, often growing on rocks, very common to ponds. Um, a phantasomenon, uh, these kind of planktonic filaments that bunch together, they look like tiny little grass clippings. Okay, so if you see tiny little grass clippings floating around in the lake and nobody's cutting lawn big enough to cover the entirety of Grand Lake St. Mary's, you've probably got a fan of um, This does fix atmospheric nitrogen. Uh, some people actually eat this stuff. It's not something I'd recommend, uh, but uh, you know, people bottle the stuff as, as a dietary supplement. Uh, but it's not regulated, so watch it. And this is very common around Ohio, and historically it has been very common on Lake Erie. Uh, lingvia is another benthic thing. It grows on the bottom. It forms these big, hairy filaments. Recently very common to Lake Erie and uh, 
can possibly spread to shallow water inland, so it's one to watch for. It um, forms these dense mats along the bottom, really hairy stuff. Later on, those mats will break free and flow to the surface and wash up on shore and make these big, stinky black mounds. Um, it lacks specialized cells, but it can still fix nitrogen, and recently, as I've mentioned, very problematic on western Lake Erie. Slipnus Vermontis is a recent invader to Lake Erie that has its own toxin named after it that the EPA will actually test for. These are planktonic, uh, a lot like planktothrix, so they just kind of distribute the water and make the, the water generally green. Um, they can fix nitrogen, and you can tell them apart by looking at a microscope and seeing the funny shape of their heterocytes. Uh, and only recently described in Ohio, and it's one to watch because it was first detected in Buckeye Lake and is not quite common there, so it wouldn't be a hard stretch to imagine getting into a lot of reservoirs around Ohio. Anabina, uh, historically very common. It's really nasty, funky stuff, and it can produce a very serious nerve toxin, but um, not so recently problematic. Historically a big one on Lake Erie, not as bad as it used to be. Um, it's been largely replaced by especially microcystis, but also planktothrix. And nostoc is funny because it forms these little green-like marbles. And in Asia, in particular, they think it's uh, really good stuff to eat, so they eat this stuff again. Um, once again, it looks like a fun little green grape, but it's not. I don't recommend putting the stuff in your mouth. So what it is not? Um, filamentous green algae. Okay, very common. Uh, it can be mistaken for some of the benthic forms of cyanobacteria, but filamentous green algae, while it can be a nuisance where you have nutrient issues, it's never going to be toxic. Uh, duckweeds and water meal, especially water meal from a distance, can look like a microcystis blue. So these are actually vascular plants. They don't produce any toxins. There's no problem with them regarding toxins. Um, so be vigilant, look for it before you start to blame it on um, Cyanobacteria. And finally, diatoms. Diatoms are usually early season bloomers. There are few, very few cyanobacteria that will bloom in the early season, and diatoms are very important for the food web. They kind of fuel the whole thing that ultimately culminates as fish. What causes it? So think about it from the perspective of some green thing that lives in the water. You need several resources in order to, to conduct your business. Obviously, if you're green stuff that lives in the water, you need some water. Um, you also need some kind of physical habitat, which in the case of planktonic things like microcystis, that's actually the water column itself. You distribute it through the water column. Or an appropriate substrate, an appropriate sediment on which to grow if you grow on the bottom. Um, sunlight, of course, because if you're green, you need that sunlight in order to fuel your photosynthesis and some energy of heat from the sun. But the big one, the one that is most influenced by human activity, and the one that is most readily fixed by human activity is the availability of nutrients. Okay? Um, carbon and nitrogen, big nutrients, big players, but they're not very interesting because they're pretty abundant in the landscape, in the watershed, so they're very rarely limiting. Uh, there's usually plenty enough of carbon and nitrogen to go around. What is interesting is, of course, phosphorus. Um, solid forms of phosphorus are not readily available as nutrients. They aren't very good at fueling the growth of things like algae blooms. It's to dissolve the soluble forms that are much more concerning. And because they tend to be very reactive, they tend to be retained by the landscape pretty well, meaning they tend to be relatively rare to fresh water in most cases. Okay, so very small changes in the availability of soluble phosphorus translates very, in a very big way very directly to big changes in the productivity of green stuff in the water. And that includes, unfortunately, cyanobacteria, the harmful algorithms. And in the absence of oxygen, so you've got a lot of silt or organic material along the bottom, often contains a lot of phosphorus. Along that bottom, if you've got very still, stagnant water and you lose oxygen along that bottom, Phosphorus becomes much more soluble in the absence of oxygen, okay? Meaning that phosphorus can go into solution, 
fuel that algae blue, that algae sinks to the bottom, eventually as it dies, decomposes, consumes more oxygen, less oxygen down there, makes it more phosphorus, et cetera, et cetera. You get into the cycle and start to break. There's also a very useful metric, the, the nitrogen-phosphorus ratio. Um, so nitrogen, really abundant, a lot more abundant than phosphorus. It should be kind of a benchmark, which is usually referred to as the red field ratio, named after the guy who first described it as 16 to 1. Okay, so if you've got 16 parts of nitrogen to one part of phosphorus, that's kind of the benchmark. Below that, cyanobacteria, the blue-green algae, tend to become more of a problem because a lot of them are either capable of fixing nitrogen or much better at scavenging nitrogen. So a lower nitrogen-phosphorus ratio means you've got more phosphorus available, less nitrogen. The, um, the plants and the true algae, the green algae, are less able to compete in that kind of a scenario. And in very nutrient-rich systems, that shifts upward. Okay, So if we're talking about like an aquaculture pond where they're actually feeding the water all the time, it's very nutrient rich, you can start to see problems when the nitrogen phosphorus ratio drops below 20 to 1. This is just going to provide a little bit of evidence from, from Lake Erie that it's been very well studied for a very long time regarding these organisms. So, um, of course, we had the Clean Water Act and the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement both come online in 1972. Uh, and they set phosphorus load targets for Lake Erie at uh, about 11,000 metric tons. Um, this was total phosphorus. Now, following the Clean Water Act, pretty quickly we came to those target phosphorus loads, total phosphorus loads. Um, and they've been pretty level with a little bit of wiggling around that benchmark for some time. What has changed though, and what these figures show, for some reason, even though total phosphorus has stayed relatively constant, Soluble phosphorus has been loading more strongly. The proportion of that phosphorus that is soluble is more strongly present in Lake Erie in recent years. And that's what these graphs represent. These are two rivers, for, uh, tributaries of Lake Erie. Soluble phosphorus increasing following the late 90s. And as a direct, direct response, we see more big algae blooms, including a lot of cyanobacteria. Um, 2009, the bloom um, in recent times, 2009 was touted as the worst that we've seen in modern times until 2011. And these data are real, this relative, this is not just made up for effect. Then came 2011, and we had to rewrite all the graphs that we were using because 2011 just buried everything. This is what it looked like for outer space. Uh, NOAA actually has an algorithm to look for a particular pigment that this stuff produces and they can flag it so hot colors mean higher concentrations of that pigment of cyanobacteria. So this is what it looks like when that computer processes it from outer space in 2011. Uh, but then in 2012, we had a pretty large bloom, but that bloom was very, very weak, very low concentrations. And what's different between 2011 and 2012? Well, 2011 had lots and lots of water, uh, lots and lots of rainfall very late into the season. 2012 was a very dry year, okay? And with that water from the landscape came a lot of available phosphorus. So here you can see that top line, 2011, bottom line, 2012. It's a very long-winded way, again, to say that the problem is almost always very directly correlated to the availability of phosphorus. This is also very seasonal, okay? So early in the season, you tend to see in, the, in cold water, even sometimes under ice, you will get substantial blooms of diatoms. Diatoms are true algae, we like them. We'll talk a little bit more about diatoms. Um, followed by a, a short period of time where you have a lot of green algae blooming. Then you've got a peak of the blue-green algae, the cyanobacteria. But you'll note that blue-green algae also tend to kind of operate at a baseline throughout the season. Uh, Planktothrix in particular is good at operating in cold water. So a quick summary of contributing factors. First and foremost, an ar a harmful algal bloom is almost always indicative of excessive nutrient loading or a very strongly skewed nitrogen to phosphorus ratio. Low water levels in sites with very small watersheds can concentrate nutrients because as water evaporates, the nutrients do not. So if you have a small watershed, 
low water levels concentrate nutrients make for more likelihood of a problematic bloom. Now, Grand Lake obviously does not have a very small watershed. So here, the bigger influence is going to be the excessive runoff in nutrients in a season that has a lot of rain. Lack of competition for nutrients. Um, so if you have a lot of vascular plants, if you have a lot of submerged, a lot of classic seaweeds growing in water, you very rarely have problems because those things need nutrients to grow and they tie up the nutrients for the period of time that they're growing at least. Calm water, these things tend to like calm water much better than uh, very agitated water. High water temperatures. And finally, where it's an issue, like on Lake Erie, uh, selective grazing. Uh, by both zooplankton, but also things like zebra mussels. So zebra mussels are very selective for eating green algae and diatoms. Uh, they kick out the stuff they do not like. They remove all the competition for all that phosphorus. That leaves all of the blue-green stuff free to grow. And of course, as we talked about, the progression of seasons plays a role too. So concerns. Um, first, let's talk a little bit, before we talk about the concerns related to harmful algal blooms, let's talk just a little bit about the true algae, uh, namely the diatoms. They have a little silica, they harvest silica from the environment and they make a little glass wall for themselves to live in. These have extremely high concentrations of fats in their tissue. Okay, so these guys get eaten up by the little bugs. The little fish eat the little bugs, the big fish eat the little fish. These are the guys, these true algae are the guys that directly contribute to the food webs that people value. I want this stuff growing, I want this stuff competing for nutrients, and in doing so, both fueling the food web I like and providing helpful competition against things I don't like, like blue-green algae. Um, these are cool water blooms, as mentioned, they often sometimes even bloom under the ice. Then the green algae. Closely related to higher plants, the green algae are very much like higher plants. They rarely form very large blooms, just kind of as a brief period in the early summer, and less lipid, less fats than the diatoms, but still very nutritious, very important to the food web. So here's a very simplified food web. You can see here, we've got the true algae, the plankton, the phytoplankton feeding the tiny bugs, the zooplankton, which then feed the tiny fish, which then feed the big fish, and guys like Eugene are very happy because Eugene likes fish. Um, I've also added this food web way out in the corner, the blue-green algae, okay? These things uh, in bad situations are toxic. Um, in good situations, nothing really likes to eat them. Any energy that goes into fueling a large bloom of these organisms is pretty much an energetic dead end. Okay? It provides competition for everything that I believe to be useful. So the real concerns with harmful algal blooms, they can pollute ponds and recreational areas with these nasty scums that smell bad. They can cause taste and odor problems in drinking water and fish tissue, which we'll talk a little bit about more. Uh, they reduce oxygen levels through the daily cycle because if you've got a huge biomass of the stuff when the sun is shining on it, it's making oxygen as part of photosynthesis. But as soon as the sun goes down, it's still respiring, so it's consuming oxygen. So especially in a small volume of water like a pond, you've got a big bloom, you can cause a daily oxygen crash that risks fish heads. Cause processing problems for water plants because having to remove a lot of carbon is difficult for water processing. And in the worst situations, harmful algal blooms are called harmful algal blooms because they have the capability of potentially producing toxins. Um, toxins can cause very serious health problems for animals and humans if ingested. Uh, but the presence of one of these organisms does not necessarily mean that the toxins are present. Uh, they don't always produce toxins. It's not easy to predict when or why they're going to produce toxins. So if you really want to know if the toxins are there, you've got to test. And of course, the EPA tests very routinely on a site like Grand Lake. Let's talk just a little bit about these taste and odor, odor compounds. The two most commonly referred ones are geosmin and methylisoborneol, which is usually abbreviated MIB because only nerds like to say methylisoborneol. Um, so if you have a big harmful algal bloom, these compounds are potentially there. Okay? Very strongly correlated to water temperatures, so you're more likely to have these stinky compounds if the water's warm. And 
they tend to be negatively correlated to wind. So in a windy season, you've got less stick. Um, and here is a brief table of human detection thresholds. So if this stuff is liberated, uh, if you're drinking water that has just a tiny bit of this stuff in it, your water is going to start to taste muddy at around 1 100th of a part per billion of these chemicals. These things are really easily detected by people. These chemicals are not toxic, but they taste bad. Uh, they are much more easily detected in lean fish, things like yellow perch, than oily fish, things like trout. Um, so very easily detected in water. More problematic with larger fish because these things do accumulate and persist for a very long time. So an older fish is more likely to have more of the stuff present. Fattier tissues like trout hold increased concentrations for longer, but it's harder for people to detect them in fattier fish like trout. In spite of having a much lower concentration present in lean fish, things like yellow perch or bluegill, things that people like to really eat on a site like this, in spite of them able to hold lower concentrations, these chemicals are much more easy to taste in lower concentrations in these fish. So let's talk about the toxins. They come in several categories. First off are the nerve toxins and you know, the um, acute symptoms of, of nerve toxin poisoning. They can be tingling, dizziness, headaches, etc. Cumulative effects over time are not well recognized, but it's suspected there's probably uh, relationships to dementia or degenerative disorders. The liver toxins are much more commonly present and much more commonly tested. Um, acute poisoning symptoms are going to be gastrointestinal issues. You're going to feel it in your gut and it's going to hurt. Uh, you might have diarrhea, you might have vomiting, uh, and these can both have acute and again chronic exposure issues but the chronic exposure issues again are not well studied um, when you hear of, of animals especially livestock dying it's almost always attributed to these liver toxins and then skin toxins which in essence they just are kind of an irritant they make you itch and some people are more re re responsive to this stuff than others um, it's in essence like an allergic reaction but every uh, the, every category of these toxins is commonly produced by organisms that are native and present in Ohio. How toxic are these things? So here we've got a table that has things like antifreeze or cyanide toxic things. Okay, so I'm going to flag some of the cyanotoxins, some of the toxins that are produced by cyanobacteria by blue green algae. Okay, so in the grand scheme of stuff that's poisonous, some of these things, um, especially the liver toxin, microcystin LR, and the nerve toxin, saxitoxin, some of these things are some of the most toxic substances that human beings are aware of. These liver and nerve toxins are those that are likely to be tested by the Ohio EPA. Um, the Ohio EPA doesn't test for skin toxins, again, because it's not likely to have a long-term or a serious acute effect. And down here, I have some of the common organisms in Ohio and what of those toxins they're capable of producing. Okay, And I have bolded two rows, microcystis and plankothrix, and I bolded those two rows because those are the organisms that are most common here on Grand Lake. So I'm not going to go into great detail of this, but if you want to talk about any of it, ask questions as we get to the end. Microcystins are far and away the best studied of these toxins. These are a liver toxin. Um, the World Health Organization issued guidelines for microcystin in 2003. An Ohio scientist was very involved in that. A guy named Dr. Carmichael, based at um, Wayne State University. Um, the World Health Organization uh, recommends some kind of action be taken when microcystins get above one part per billion in drinking water. One part per billion. Um, risk of human health, adult human health, from recreational contact. So if you're out there swimming, if you're out there boating, some of this stuff is going to get on your, your face. 
you're going to wipe your nose, you're going to ingest some of it accidentally, okay? And so from recreational contact, the World Health Organization estimated 4 to 20 parts per billion to be a moderate risk of human health problems from recreational contact. That's for adults. Because the Ohio EPA was concerned about children, they set a level at 6 parts per billion because not only do children have much less mass than I do, um, much less than I do, uh, but children also are much more likely to ingest yucky water by accident. But I think it's very conspicuous. This is a quote from the World Health Organization, uh, and I'll go ahead and read it because it sounds uh, it's conspicuous. In comparing the available indications of hazards from cyanotoxins with other water-related health hazards, it is conspicuous that cyanotoxins have caused numerous fatal poisonings of livestock and wildlife but no human fatalities due to oral uptake have been documented. None. No human has been shown to die from putting this stuff in their mouth, even accidentally. Now, there was a big event in Brazil where some contaminated water got into dialysis treatment. Okay, so in essence, human beings were injected directly with microcystin. That killed a lot of people. But no human being has been confirmed to have died from putting this in their mouth. And why do animals die all the time and people not? Well, animals, they like to put yucky looking water in their mouth. You know, it smells organic and rich. That's the kind of thing that animals think that they would get a little perk of nutrition from. People just don't like to put yucky water in their mouth. They're really good at avoiding it. On Grand Lake. Uh, so nowadays, you're probably fully aware of this, microcystin detections are present in low concentrations throughout the year. Uh, very low in wintertime, of course, it gets much higher in the warm seasons. Uh, for 2015, the first detection above that EPA threshold for contact advisories, six parts per billion, that occurred on the 18th of February at the water intake for the city of Salina. The highest detection this year to date, um, 162 parts per billion at Windy Point Beach um, on the 15th of June, mid-June. Uh, this map I just pulled last night, uh, this you can get this data very easily from ohioalgainfo.com and you'll see those two blips there. Right there, that's Grand Lake. The one with the little pointy tail at the bottom of it, that's the water intake, um, which is low there. But uh, right now, or at least as of the last reading, on the 27th of July, there were 100 parts per billion detected at the campground beach, which I'm sure you're aware of. People often ask about the presence of the toxin. So I talked about the presence of taste and odor compounds in fish. People often ask about the presence of toxins in fish tissue. Okay? Freshwater fish are fortunate in the fact that they live in fresh water. Okay? Most living things, most uh, living things with backbones are made up of mostly water. Okay? And if you live immersed in fresh water all the time, your biggest problem is getting rid of water. So they're excreting water all the time and ingesting very little of it. So freshwater fish tend to have few issues with the accumulation of toxins. Also, um, these toxins are really toxic. The liver doesn't like them being in you. Livers if your liver is alive, it's very actively removing these toxins. Okay, so these things tend to, have you guys heard of bioaccumulation? Where you get a persistent toxin like mercury that appears in the food web and the little bugs get full of mercury, little fish eat the bugs, mercury gets more concentrated in the little fish. Big fish eat the little fish, the mercury gets more and more concentrated every step up the food web it goes. Cyanotoxins do not do that because they're not persistent. Cyanotoxins are very actively eradicated by living livers, so there's no evidence that cyanotoxins bioaccumulate up the food web. Um, now, if a fish is present in a big bloom, those toxins can be present in the muscle tissue, in the fillets, but those, the presence of those toxins is very short-lived being eliminated in a matter of hours to days, depending upon the situation and how bad the concentration is in the water. The toxins are going to be persistent for much longer in livers and other internal organizations, but especially livers. Frankly, I don't know anybody who's really fond of eating fish livers, so that's kind of good. Um, at a minimum, you know, remove skin the fillets, don't eat the internal organism, organs, and wash those fillets with municipal water. Municipal water 
if they know it's coming, municipal water is really, really good at removing cyanotoxins. You very rarely find cyanotoxins in municipal water supplies, in finished water. But the bottom line is, you know, if you're out there and you're, you're, you're boating around in a thick green scum and you catch a few crappie, well, you know, use a little bit of discretion. I probably would not eat that crappie. I'll come back next week and eat, eat you know, from somewhere else where that big green scum is not. Management strategies. Um, I, if we're talking about management ponds, I usually talk about management by cliche, meaning that ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So stop it from happening. Once the bloom is underway, it's really too late to do much about it, other than preparing to prevent it next year. Um, so much more valuable than treatment, but that's really easy to tell people who are managing ponds that have very small watersheds, small volume of water, a small watershed, usually with only one owner of that watershed. Much more challenging when you're talking about a site like Grand Lake that has a massive watershed with a whole lot of legitimate interests and very diverse practices that are wholly legitimate. Much harder to manage on a site like this. Um, a little bit of regulatory stuff. Um, the well, this, this is not quite regulatory yet. So this is recommended voluntary action. Ohio has a phosphorus task force that focuses on Western Lake Erie. They released a really big report in 2013 that lists 20 recommendations for watershed management practices. This is written for Western Lake Erie, but frankly, all of these practices would apply equally well to Grand Lake. Um, the challenging bottom line is they, they recommend a 40% reduction in loads of phosphorus from all sources. Not just agriculture, they're targeting absolutely everybody. So from municipal um, sewage treatment, from your own personal lawn, from your own water use, use um, everybody should be reducing their discharge of phosphorus by 40%. Now, uh, for you, how you can have that kind of effect you know, every time you flush that toilet, that goes to a sewage treatment plant that ultimately has to move that water somewhere else. So if you provide them with a larger volume of water, you're providing them with a larger amount of water they have to treat. So simple things like turn off your water between dishes when you're resing dishes. Install um, low volume toilets because they discharge less than half what the old fashioned high volume toilets discharge. So doing these very simple things, frankly, it's easy for a lot of households, if they take the time, to get to that target. But we're talking about individual households. Not so easy when we're talking about large landscapes that are producing the food that I like to eat. Um, Ohio now has the ability to declare a watershed in distress, okay? And when that happens, the state requires anybody who applies fertilizer to the landscape to generate nutrient management plans and rein in their use of fertilizers, bring them within a certain list of standards. To date, the only watershed where they've applied this, where they've declared a watershed in distress, is Grand Lake. Also in 2014, they began requiring certification for anybody who applies fertilizers to 50 or more acres. And that is almost everybody who's involved in food production. 50 acres is not a lot in modern agriculture. Okay, so. Anybody who applies fertilizer to 50 acres needs to be certified so they, in theory, know better how to keep it on the landscape and have it less likely to run off into the watershed. But the big one is this brand new agricultural pollution abatement program that uh, was kind of messed up when it was introduced last year because they attached a bunch of um, appendices to it to do things like give more freedom to puppy mills and, and um, remove the requirement for people to provide phone service in, in rural places. A lot of things that had nothing to do with the original bill. So it disappeared last year, but it re-emerged at the beginning of this year, moved very quickly, and actually became enacted as of July of this year. Okay? <clears throat> so it puts a lot of the enforcement authority for nutrient management into the hands of the Department of Agriculture, bans the application of, of manure or fertilizer to frozen ground, or water uh, ground that's water saturated or application even in uh, immediate advance of a rainstorm to limit the likelihood of runoff to the water. Applies similar standards to even smaller agricultural operations. Um, 
although they can apply for exception, uh, not beyond though, oops, I think that's 2016. Uh, that exception, I'd have to look it up, sorry. Um, requires water treatment to monitor their phosphorus discharges uh, for related to Lake Erie. It forbids open uh, dredge disposal within the open water of Lake Erie. Uh, revises some funding for Lake Erie issues. But um, in addition to transferring authority to the Department of Agriculture and all of these um, nutrient management requirements, the other thing that's important is that it designates the Environmental Protection Agency to coordinate harmful wound response and protocols for testing, et cetera, et cetera. So they are now mandated to have some kind of standardized approach in mind, at least for the state of Ohio. So the futuristic view. I was asked to, to give a similar talk once, and I was asked to predict the future. I will tell you, approach anybody claiming to predict the future with extreme skepticism, even guys with um, notoriously villainous mustaches. So, if we continue to load these systems with nutrients, cyanobacteria is going to continue to be a problem. That's just the way it goes. Uh, given the nature of the Grand Lake watershed, even as we start to clean up these problems, even as we start to apply less phosphorus to the watershed, it's going to take a while before that phosphorus works its way through the system. This is not a quick fix. This is going to take a matter of years, probably decades. Um, I know that the Lake Erie Phosphorus Task Force is really keen on voluntary action. I'm really skeptical about voluntary action. It's hard to get people to change their habits until the hammer of the law falls on their head. Um, so we have those laws in place now, at least starting towards those laws. I expect those laws to start making a substantial difference. General public is likely to continue to misinterpret facts, downplay their own personal role in the issue, for example, from lawn care, suburban development, etc., and point fingers of scapegoatery at the agriculture industry in spite of their own fondness for food. We're all part of this issue. We should not point fingers at agriculture. Everything we do, even eating food produced by agriculture, relates to this issue. Okay, so think about your practice, think about how it ties to these issues, and make changes in your own personal choices to fix them. And the agriculture industry, unfortunately, is likely to feel put upon by the scientific and management communities, uh, who I don't think are putting upon them. The public often is, mostly from their own misinterpretation, um, but I think they feel put upon by scientific and management communities, even when they're not actually pointing fingers at them. Sad but true. If you want a lot of info, it's been mentioned already earlier today, OhioAlgaeInfo.com is a really good clearinghouse for all of the information going on in Ohio related to cyanobacteria aren't algal blooms. It's uh, housed by the Ohio EPA, but with contributions from the Department of Health and Department of Natural Resources. I wrote a fact sheet a few years back. I've got several copies of that here. It's just very general information for the general public. If you want some, feel free to ask for it. I've got a pile. I'm ready to take some questions, but the real purpose of this slide is I like to look at pictures of myself with fish. And there's where you can find me.